Taliban had already taken over Kabul. They were in our streets, they were at our doorsteps. It was a scary situation and they were seeing Taliban, they were seeing thousands of people there, they were seeing fighting. <laughs> My ties with the United States had put me under a serious threat. I used to work for the government who put me at a high risk in a target. If we didn't move to get them out, nobody was coming for them. I started working in Afghanistan about 20 years ago and have a constant flow of students from Afghanistan who I'm always eager to link up with. We were already in touch with several of our Fletcher alum and our Friedman alum as we saw the situation just deteriorating extremely rapidly in Afghanistan. So I was moving from one place to another, hiding myself and my relatives. And one of uh, my friends, who was also a tough alum, he had heard that. Fletcher School is trying to help its alumni in Afghanistan, and that's how we contacted Diane, who was our professor. We knew we had to mobilize something, and what we mobilized was the Fletcher Network. You know, if I could describe the Fletcher Network, there is an intensity of connection, there is a seriousness of purpose, and it feels more like a family than not. It really started out at first being myself and PhD student Lima Ahmad. Lima is from Afghanistan. She's played a substantial role in helping to shape her country's future. She's a very strong women's rights leader. And she and I had been in regular contact because the situation was deteriorating so rapidly. My uh, entire uh, family was in Afghanistan at that time. I just sent an email. I said, I have lost all hopes, my family is stuck there, and I don't think so I will be able to go there. Just help me, guide me. And within moments, I received emails, not only from my fellow friends, but from the dean herself, from different professors. Very early on, I was in contact with the dean, Rachel Kite, and she was absolutely instrumental. So I'm always struck by the fact that when you pick up the phone and you say, I'm from Fletcher, and you're ringing an alumnus or alumna of Fletcher, there's a point of connection, there's an instant connection. There were so many people in positions that could help. There were so many people in every kind of agency that you would need to respond to a crisis like this, there were Fletcher people, and they immediately mobilized. We had Afghans who knew much more about what was going on on the ground. We had Western countries who were nominally in the process of evacuating their own nationals out of these situations. We had international organizations and we had all the neighboring countries that were immediately impacted by what was going on in Afghanistan. And because of our extensive network, we had key people in key places almost everywhere. What we had to do was have a small team at Fletcher that then could interact with every one of those moving pieces. And Lima, Diane and uh, Abby really were the core of what became a really quite extensive effort. You know, as an ad hoc group of who can affect change, who has the network, the knowledge of, for me, how the military is working on the ground, for Diane, her awareness of what chaos looks like in a humanitarian situation, Rachel's you know, her experience, her network, especially in diplomatic circles, was essential. Lima was unbelievable at being able to assemble the people. Everything was fragile. Neither the U.S. government or the people involved, nobody knew what we were doing, what anybody was doing. So throughout helping my family out, we learned a lot that we could help other people. and our Fletcher alums family there, and more artists and women rights activists. I think it was very important that Lima had this big network inside the country and on the ground, and the trust that they had in Lima, they believed in the process. When we knew that our people were on the manifest for State Department, now the challenge was how to bring them to the airport, because by that time it became like a valley of death. A number of people were trying to get people out, 
and we had been linked into these networks. What we had that they often didn't have on the ground is we had a lot of Afghan Conte attacks who could get vehicles because the U.S. military and the other militaries, for the most part, were not leaving the airport, so we had to have civilian vehicles to move people in. So what I did, I just called the people I knew in Afghanistan, and especially the families that we helped them out, were that you need to arrange cars. And it was literally the middle of the night, and we said, you need to get five vans in less than an hour. One of my tasks was to get one of the vans. And we rented two because I knew that there were other people coming and joining us. When she called me, it was uh, two o'clock in the morning. Professor Kayan helped us to get a van. We gave them an hour notice to leave everything behind, take their family members, pack one small bag, and to meet at a location only disclosed to them 10 minutes before they arrived. When our people arrived to the meeting location, there were too many people. They had brought their nieces, and rightfully so, given what the Taliban was going to do to them. And they couldn't fit all the people and the luggage in the car, so all the luggage was thrown out. People loaded into the car, sometimes sitting um, three on top of each other. There were at least three vans for the pleasure group. So in each van, there were a coordinator, and the coordinators were coordinating with each other. Those Afghans who were Maha graduates were able then to organize, to provide leadership, not only as heads of households to their own families, but to many, many, many others. And these vans had in, I mean, half of the group that we pulled out, our children. It was very challenging and keeping everybody calm inside, you know, the vans, particularly the kids. There was no toilet, there was no food, there was no water. There were so much shootings. I myself uh, had never experienced shooting like that and from such a close distance. They were instructed by the kind of military handler, who I imagine was watching them with drones, to just continue driving and parking and moving as he weaved them through you know, probably 800,000 people crowded in front of that airport. And I was constantly calling Diane and other, getting instruction, okay, what's next, what should we do? Where should we stand, where should we go? So a lot of split-second decisions had to be made. People were told to move on a dime. Okay, get ready, move. Okay, get ready, move. Nothing happening, move this way, move that way, move this way, okay, wait, go. And then we directly went to uh, the main uh, gate of the airport, but the Taliban did not allow us. And they were firing in the air and as well as they were beating people with their guns. There was no getting out of the vehicles for what became 24 hours. That was a really chaotic time. People uh, feeling sick, people getting really frustrated because we had children within cars. We had elderly that were sick. What I could see in front of me was like a life-threatening risk in front of the airport. There was a risk and threat of bomb blasts, there were shootings, and at one point, a bullet came and shoot in front of the car. It was this constant negotiation to get us direct lines into the U.S. commanders in that base. At one point, Diane contacted me and said, do you have the contact information for one of the commanders on the ground? And I said, well, I have an email address. And she said, would you please write him an email that our group is outside of these gates and we need entrance in. We finally got permission, um, but then the different governments who were controlling the access to the airport decided that no, they needed a little bit more to let our group in. At that point, we called Rachel Kite and just said, like, they're out in the open, they're on the road. We need these requests at a high level to allow the seas to part so that we can get to the gate. And she was able to do that. Well, so I think each of us were using our Rolodexes whether or not they were alumni or not. And I mean, I rang people in, in Europe, in NATO, in the United Nations, people that I've known and built relationships with over the course of my career and they would say ah yes Rachel but they would say oh yes the Fletcher school so there was something about Fletcher and there was something also about the fact that people knew that we were going above and beyond we, we're not going to leave people behind and so at that point what was going on is that the US military commander in charge of the airport was arguing with the Taliban saying you better open those gates these people are coming through and you will open those gates and I'm sending out special forces Afghan Special Forces opened the gates, they came out, they were shooting.
So everybody started panicking. We thought that the Taliban in the U.S. started fighting. And then we, we talked to Diane. Diane said, no, she had had a communication there or with someone at the airport and said that was for our safety. They're shooting above the heads of people, but they're trying to clear people. And they got in and shut the doors. We were taken to an assembly point inside the airport where we thought, okay, that's it. We got in and maybe in another hour or so we will be in the plane and we will be departing. Once our team was inside the gates, then it was up to us again to get them on a plane. And that was no small task. There were literally thousands and thousands of people trapped inside that airport, everybody desperate to get out. But unfortunately, as soon as we got inside the airport, the plane got canceled. So uh, Lehman Dayan told us we have to wait and they will try to find another flight for us. And then we were taken to another place and that place was just like full of garbage. It was so dirty. There was a disease outbreak already. They had had tens of thousands of people pass through that airport. There were no toilet facilities. The weather during the day was quite hot, but during the night it was cold. It was quite difficult for aged people or people that they were sick and also for the children. We were tapped in to intelligence coming in and them saying there's there's an imminent attack, an imminent attack, you know, brace yourselves. And when the suicide bomb went off, it was at a gate that was close to where our team was. We also wished the soldiers that they were killed or injured. And it was another shock for our children and women. It was really difficult. And then the U.S. forces shutting the door and sealing it. And at that point, they said, you've got to get us out of here because we are literally sealed in here. And if the U.S. forces leave, we're going to be like sheep in a slaughter. I could see the fear in the eyes of everyone. It was the worst experience that I had personally. Uh, and as well as my family members and uh, many other people that they were with us. What are we going to do? We can't go back because now we have certainly and definitely put our lives at risk. All flights were cancelled. Everything went to zero. We were hearing all these scary uh, stories that the uh, U.S. military is going to leave everybody behind because they are scared, like if there are other planes, there might be some missile that will be fired at the plane, so they are taking no one. So we were working with a group called No One Left Behind. They're a group of American ex-military and current military who have made a vow that they are not going to leave their Afghan and Iraqi colleagues who they worked closely with behind to be killed under the new regimes. And so they were providing flights out. And we were just booking ourselves on every possible flight. There were many flights scheduled, like first to Kosovo, there was also one to Macedonia. And then, you know, so many messages came in, and but one after another would get cancelled. And so the first flight that came in was going to Albania, and Abigail Liddington had contacts in Albania. So she was already working those contacts to make sure that when our people arrived, the government of Albania knew them, they knew they were associated with us, they were our team, you know, to keep a, an eye out for them. That was the time when the, the rush started. We said like, they have, to, they have to be on this plane. We were the first flight out, the first civilian flight after the suicide bomb. And we were told that while they would provide air cover, they could not prevent a surface-to-air missile or a rocket-propelled grenade from taking the plane down. We checked in with our team leaders. They said, put us on that plane. For me, I was scared, but I said, OK, we need to go. We cannot get out of the airport. Even if we go out, there are Taliban, there again, is going to kill us. So there are two options. Now choose which one you want to go for. And we choose the one to go to the plane. The plane left and me and Diane said like, we will be checking news if there was any attack on the plane. If not, then we will believe that they have left peacefully. So it wasn't until they had cleared um, airspace where they wouldn't have been hit with a missile or a rocket propelled grenade that we finally kind of released our breath. We were looking down at our country and literally I was crying because it was very difficult to leave your people, your family members and your countrymen in that situation. When we reached Albania, I felt the confidence for the first time, okay, that at least my children and my family are safe in here. 
and there is no sound of guns and fires and rockets for the first time in our life. Getting to Albania was the most uh, happiest moments, but at the same time we were so sad leaving our families, our friends, our country, our jobs, literally everything. Being part of an effort to get people out of Afghanistan to safety wasn't easy, but it was the first chapter in what is going to be a long story. We have a responsibility for many people in third countries and making sure that they're the countries to whom they are headed don't leave them in limbo longer than they need to be. And then we have a responsibility for these people when they get to wherever their final destination is. And for many of them, that will be the United States. How they will start their lives from zero is a big mental pressure. And we as a Fletcher family or Fletcher community can still be there for these newly arriving Afghan families. Right now, the people, are, our Fletcher colleagues, are being supported by us in the network. People associated with the schools have given money to a fund we've started, and we've used this for all the things you need to make a, a life work. Lima has been essential at keeping us connected with the people in the Fletcher community, which we have been able to evacuate, and letting us know what is the next step? What is their next need? This moral support, you know, checking on us from Fletcher, they gave us the hope and the feeling that, okay, we are not alone here. And now that we are hopeful that we will be going to the U.S., we have people there, we have Fletcher community that's gonna help us start a new life in the U.S. I think this network has proven many, many times that our human connection or human support for each other goes beyond our borders and country. It is these stories of a few individuals who selflessly work to help people across the world that restores our belief in humanity and our hope for a better future. This group of people is, is worth all of my energy. I want the best for them. They have so much to give to us and I wasn't leaving them behind. The world is messy. Solutions are often messy too, but there is a simplicity to the very essential point of Fletcher, which is that to build peace, there has to be justice. And at the heart of justice is taking care of each other. And I think that many of our faculty, many of our students, and many of the staff have lived through messy, have studied messy, but are even therefore more committed to the simplicity of what it takes to make things better. <laughs>